Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of The Best Games Period. I'm your host Jack Gardner and with me this week is just my mouth hole and you sweet, wonderful, beautiful, handsome and otherwise attractive listeners. And this week I'm going to be going over a game that at one point was receiving a ton of praise and acclaim and has kind of since fallen by the wayside, just kind of by the course of time. Um, It's the kind of game I could see probably a lot of mods being released for, a lot of expansions if uh, the developers had felt like, you know, going that route, but uh, they, they instead chose to kind of put it out into the world, fine-tune it a little bit, put it on as many platforms as possible, and then just be done and move on to something else. This week I'm talking about FTL colon Faster Than Light, which is a phenomenal roguelike, and if you haven't heard of it before, it's basically this game that puts you in the shoes of a captain of a spaceship. And your goal is to deliver some vital intelligence to the Federation, which is kind of this this bastion of hope and light in the galaxy, or at least that's what you're told. And behind you is the Rebellion, and the Rebellion is kind of this big, overwhelming evil force, and you have to escape it and make it to the Federation before you face down the flagship of the Rebellion fleet, and it is a fantastic roguelike. So basically, every time you play, you can kind of choose what kind of a ship you want and what kind of layout that ship has. And you have uh, different crew members, and you can name them all, so each time you know, you can have a completely different adventure. Um, and the galaxy that you play in is randomly generated, and you go to different star clusters and can kind of explore the different things you find in them. Um, and you, it's the, these multiple branching paths, and you kind of... Um, you, you basically have to just survive. And not only survive, but you have to, as you're making this journey, outfit your ship to be the best possible version of itself that it can be under your current circumstances so that you have a shot when you make it to the very end of taking down the rebel flagship. Now, this is all complicated by the fact that the very beginning of the game, they tell you the rebel fleet's coming. And what that means is you have a certain amount of time within each of these sections of the galaxy that you travel through and choose as your destination to scavenge or explore and get new stuff. But that rebel fleet, it's always a coming. And so you need to kind of balance your time against your needs. And as you start out, things will be easier. Uh, the, the various encounters and scenarios you, um, kind of come up against will have lower thresholds of, of, you know, failure. You know, it it will be very hard to fail early on. But as you get into the third, fourth, fifth sectors, uh, things are going to get a little bit more difficult and you face some challenges that could very well uh, destroy you. Um, For example, um, for example, there, there is always an option whenever you trade with another ship to just decide to blow it up and take its scrap and hope that maybe some of the cargo survives. Now, that's very easy early on in the game, but later on, you're going to be facing ships that are more or less on equal terms with you. And that can kind of get to be... um, It it creates a lot of opportunities for do-or-die moments, which are pretty exciting. They can be kind of frustrating, though. And that's kind of one of the things to keep in mind if you play faster than light and you've never played it before you need to go into it expecting to fail because it can take you a very 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 long time to actually make it through a full run of faster than light and succeed at the very end against that final boss and that's just on the normal difficulty there there is an additional harder difficulty that ups the challenge and that whew 
Do not recommend that unless you are an experienced player and know kind of what you're getting into. But you have a bunch of different concerns to weigh while you're fleeing from the rebel fleet. And those are fuel and scrap. And so now fuel, it's pretty self-explanatory. That's what you need to get between the different stars and, you know, keep on flying. Well, it's possible to run out of fuel. And what happens when you run out of fuel is uh, your ship has to send out a distress beacon, which, granted, that means that other ships are able to find you and sell you fuel, which is great. Uh, Sometimes very kind passersby will just give you fuel. Uh, But it also broadcasts your location to opportunists, which means sometimes people will come by to fight you. And it also broadcasts your location to the rebel fleet. Which means that while you're in a while you're having your distress beacon out, it's closing in much faster than normal. So there there are just these moments where you are on the edge of your seat, and sometimes and and part of what makes that tension is the fact that there is the very real possibility that you are not going to make it, especially if you named your ship and the crew members. You know that can feel personal and it, you you have some degree of investment into that and it's uh I, I think it's a really neat way to kind of up the ante it's the it's the whole XCOM thing where if you name your soldiers after people you know you have more personal investment into their stories and adventures than you would otherwise granted there's a part of me that also says maybe that's not the best way to handle characters in games to just give all of that over to players um, because you know not all players are wired like that you know some not everyone wants to uh, go through the hassle of mentally making those characters themselves that 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 you're you're offloading mental work onto players and some sometimes that works out really really well and sometimes I'm not. Uh, sometimes I'm a little split on it. Sometimes that doesn't work out so well. But that's a that's just a com- kind of a completely separate issue from what I what I'm talking about um, with FTL. So your other concern is scrap. Now scrap is kind of the currency of FTL. It's what you use to buy stuff. It's what you use to upgrade your ship. And now that presents a really interesting decision point because as a player do you want to just upgrade the stuff you have or do you want to hold on to this scrap and hope that the opportunity to buy something better comes along and oftentimes that opportunity does come along but you know you it might provide you the opportunity to get a super weapon which would be really sweet but at what cost because the other thing that scrap can do is it can repair your ship, which is very, very, very important because you're probably going to be running into a lot of people who want to shoot you and blow you up. Now, all of that being said, you have, I, I guess I haven't really gotten into the mechanics of how gameplay works in FTL. So how it works is you are given a top-down view of your ship and you can see all the different rooms inside. And most of these rooms have different purposes. Like, there is the, you know, obviously the pilot's chair. Um, that that helps you steer the ship. Um, in fact, unless you upgrade that quite a bit, you have to have someone in that room to steer the ship and keep it flying. Otherwise, it won't go anywhere. And uh, if you don't have someone flying the ship, there is a 100% chance that projectiles fired at you will hit you because you are stationary, which I think is a great little touch. There, are, But then there are also kind of subsystems. So, like, there's the medical room. There is the door control room because you can actually control whether or not all of these doors are open or shut, which is actually a very, very, very valuable ability in this game. So you never really want to lose your door control room. Um, and you can actually have someone stationed there and that ups the levels of your doors. So one of the things in FTL is you can have enemies board your ship and they can beam aboard or they can like through some kind of, uh, you know, pod that attaches to your ship and breaks through the hull, you know, board your ship that way. Um, 
they if you have no one in your door control room and if the doors are not upgraded those people can just walk anywhere on your ship but if you have someone in the door control room or have upgraded your doors that means they have effectively locked and so it will take a little bit of time for boarders and intruders to break through those doors which can buy you precious seconds to defend your vessel. And one of the best ways to defend your vessel, and this is all just with doors, not even bringing in, you know, crew members that specialize in in fighting other people or anything like that, you can just open the doors to the vacuum of space. And that will slowly kill most intruders, provided that they need oxygen because there are some that don't need oxygen. The downside of this is that if you vent all of your vent vent all of that atmosphere into space, well then you need to replenish it, which usually isn't a problem because you have an oxygen room. Well, if your oxygen room gets damaged, then you need to have someone in that room repairing it, otherwise you're just going to slowly run out of oxygen and it's a very bad situation. That being said, you can also choose to target the oxygen room on the enemy ship. And one of the neat things about that is if you actually manage to kill everyone aboard an enemy ship without you know, actually blowing it up, uh, you get more scrap, you get more money, you get more rewards because the ship is intact and you can kind of scrap all of it that way. I think that's really neat. I think that's a really cool mechanic. Um... And then you have, of course, the engine room, and you have the uh, you know, weapons rooms, and having someone in the engine room, for example, helps increase your evasion. Having someone in the weapon room decreases the cooldown time on your lasers or rail guns or whatever you're using. Um, and then there are also the optional modules. So, like, you can have a ship that has drones. So you can have a ship that has a teleporter. You can have a ship that has like a special, uh, super special beam cannon or something along those lines. And all of that stuff have have these special rooms that you can station crew members in. And so there is kind of this neat little metagame during during combat where you can move crew members around to different rooms to repair them or operate them at a higher efficiency level. Uh, And that leads to a lot of the fun and strategy of the game. Now, outside of drawing back a little bit farther outside of that, you have uh, kind of the... It's almost a turn-based system where the ships are fighting each other, um, but it's not quite. So basically, you will have whatever armament your ship has available to it, and you will, depending on you know your upgrades for the ship, Uh, have certain cooldowns for those and when combat starts everything's on cooldown unless you have a special upgrade for your ship that has everything up and ready to fire right at the start and you wait for the cooldowns to come up come all the way down and then you fire your guns but the thing is you can actually pause combat at any time to kind of reevaluate your strategy and you can choose which rooms you want to fire at uh, that all is can be complicated by you know not having good enough sensors. It can be complicated by uh, an enemy having shields. You know there there are a whole lot of these different little things that the ships can be outfitted with that kind of throw a wrench into your plans. And then there's also just you know there's the possibility of missing. And Granted, usually, and again, right at the start, you'll be able to hit most things most of the time. But as you go along, you'll find out that there are different abilities that uh, automatically mean you miss. For example, when a ship cloaks, if a shot is in transit and your target cloaks, that shot misses. And that can be very frustrating, especially if you're a newer player to FTL. But the thing is, that works both ways. So a strategy you you see an enemy ship using to win that blew you up, you can use that same strategy. You can, you can try and get a similar setup as that ship and see if it works for you. 
And uh, one of the things I have found most effective is if you upgrade your shields a lot and you get a cloaking device on your ship, strategically using that cloak is incredibly helpful and can often get you all the way through the game. It's a, it's a really good, solidly constructed roguelike. It is one of the games I would hold up as a perfect model or a near perfect model of a roguelike. The problem is there aren't a whole lot of games out there that fall into a similar category as FTL. Um, which is unfortunate because like I was saying at the beginning, this is the kind of game that could probably be expanded time and time again. You could have larger and larger adventures, more and more weird scenarios. Um, there are actually like a, one of the strengths of FTL is kind of having this RPG adventure while you're traveling through the the galaxy, because each time you kind of, you know, have a new encounter, you know, whether it's violent or not, you have the opportunity to kind of play how you would like and playing how you would like inadvertently kind of shapes your game. Uh, not not in any like mechanical way, uh, although it, it certainly does that. What I mean is um, it shapes the narrative of what the FTL universe is like. You know, if you're going around and you're just blowing up every ship you encounter because you want their stuff, that might be indicative of the fact that, hey, maybe the rebels do have a point. Maybe Maybe the rebellion is justified if the Federation, and you are a Federation ship, uh, is just going around blowing people up indiscriminately. Well, well, maybe they have a point. Or you can kind of try and play as a noble captain. And, you know, you, you stop and you try and help everyone. Um, you know, you're doing your best to make sure everyone gets out of a situation alive. Uh, you, you know, or maybe you're a little bit more pragmatic. Uh, there, there are, for example... Uh, slave ships in the game and maybe you're willing to do business with them because you really want those crew members uh, even though it might go against your your moral code well gotta have that ship member and so all of these little decisions kind of I mean they, they don't have any any mechanical effect on the game aside from you know what you're getting out of the individual scenarios I suppose but they're also shaping that surrounding narrative in, in ways that I find very interesting and unique. Um, there, there are also secret missions embedded throughout FTL that uh, require playing through the game multiple times to even encounter. It'd be very rare to encounter all of them in one, but um, there, there's the possibility of encountering a, a completely new alien race because there are actually multiple aliens in the FTL universe. There are slug people. There are kind of big green headed telepath, al uh, not telepath, but like, uh, power aliens that, that actually like increase the power of stations that they're put at. Uh, there are these mantis like creatures that are really good at fighting. There's, um, obviously humans. And then there are rock people who are good at putting out fires um, and then there is a secret race of crystalline rock people. And then there, there's just like all these other random things that can happen. And it's, and like I said, it's really interesting because it does embrace those roguelike elements to the point where each time you play does genuinely feel like a different adventure. It's like you're kind of looking through uh, a special special prism and you can see all these different multiverses where things turned out differently for this one, uh, space spacecraft. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's like that, uh, Star Trek, the next generation episode where there, there's just all the different multiverse versions of the enterprise. So basically what I just want everyone to know is that FTL is really freaking good. And it's pretty much on everything now. I believe the last version the last version they put out was for iPads and Android. It came out back in 2012, which is quite a while ago now. 
Um, but it still holds up. It's still really fun to play. And uh, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of I kind of decided that it was time to talk about FTL just because Subset Games that this was their first game as far as I know, um, and their next game has it well it hasn't come out yet but it's on the verge of coming out. It's called Into the Breach, and it's basically a combination of like Advanced Wars and Pacific Rim. Like it has or Gundam, it has these giant robots, and it's turn-based battles on a grid, and it looks really fun. I'm super pumped to see it in action and play it. Um, and Subset Games is only, like, two people. It's uh, a guy named Justin Ma and Matthew Davis, and I believe they had multiple writers that worked on the scenarios, and one of whom I know was Chris Avalon, Avalon, Avalon? who worked on the wasteland 2 and you know he, he's been a big deal over at obsidian games uh he, he's done fallout 2 baldur's gate all kinds of different things that are just these legends in the video game industry and uh yeah so the scenarios themselves are actually pretty well written and interesting and sci-fi e there's a lot of really interesting things going on in the background of FTL, but the meat and potatoes of the game are these, it's just the really great mechanics and the really great and fun way that everything kind of comes together. Um, and I, I would be remiss if I also didn't mention uh, Ben Pr- Ben Prunty? Prunty? I have known of this man for a very long time. Still don't know how to pronounce his last name, but he has written a lot of music for various games, and I believe this is the first time he's been mentioned on the show. Um, But he he's done he's done some good good old stuff, and FTL was his first game, and he will be working on Into the Breach as well. So honestly, if you're looking for something that is going to really a suck up a lot of your time and not in a time sink kind of way, but just in a way that you're having fun and you lose track of time. And then you, it has that also that, well, I'll give it one more try appeal. One, one more game, one more turn. And so it it just takes up a lot of time, but each individual session isn't all that long. Um, Even if you play through a full game, that might take you two hours, just a straight run, maybe. Uh, it's been a while since I played it, so maybe maybe it would take a little bit longer or be a little bit shorter. I can't quite recall, but it doesn't take a terribly long time. Um, so I encourage everyone to go check out FTL Faster Than Light. Uh, and, uh, maybe, maybe keep an eye peeled for Into the Breach, which should be coming out, I believe, sometime this year. Last I heard, it was supposed to be early 2018, but with video games these days, you never know. Might get delayed. Might not. Might come out early. That sometimes happens, too. Don't get your hopes up for that, though. So, what I'm really trying to say is you should go play FTL faster than light. I'm a little bit disappointed that this couldn't be a full episode on FTL, Um, but just schedules being what they are, sometimes we can't all get together on a given week or, you know, you, you have a guest and for various reasons they can't show up. So, um, this is, for me, this does count as a best game period. I think FTL is a lovely game that doesn't rely on the cutting edge graphics or, or visual presentation, but instead delivers a really, ironically, down-to-earth space uh, combat game that is very satisfying on a tactical level and on a role-playing level, and it it just works, and I encourage everyone to go out and check it out. And with that, I believe it's time for me to give my spiel about Extra Life and what is Extra Life. So if you haven't heard of Extra Life before, it's basically this wonderful charity that is part of Children's Miracle Network Hospitals, and 
what it is is uh, people all across the United States and Canada get together every year to play video games or board games or outdoor games or really any kind of game to raise money and support Children's Miracle Network hospitals. So if you're interested in learning more, you can head over to extra-life.org where you can also sign up. And if you sign up, you can actually choose which Children's Miracle Network hospital you want to support. And then 100% of all the money you receive from friends, family, strangers, whoever, goes directly to that hospital to help sick and injured kids. It's a really fantastic charity. I highly recommend it. And if you want to kind of get more involved with the community side of things, you can head over to community.extra-life.org where you can find out a bunch of helpful information. You can also, you know, interact with people in the Extra Life community, maybe connect with people in your area. And uh, you can also read a bunch of interesting articles about games and uh, game-related issues. Uh, You can find this very podcast, actually, on the community site. And you can also find us on Game Informer and uh, SoundCloud and iTunes. And, you know, speaking of iTunes... Uh, If you enjoy listening to this show week after week, I highly encourage you to leave us a review. Uh, Even if it's not, you know, the glowingest of reviews, every review does actually help us kind of get more visibility and get our name out there, which we appreciate. And honestly, even if you don't want to leave a review, we we appreciate that. We appreciate you anyway for taking the time to listen to us talk. And uh, that makes makes us all feel warm and glowy inside. And I, I like that. I like the glow. As for other ways you can support the show, tweet about us. We're at Best Games Period on Twitter. And if you feel like contributing a dollar to us every month to just kind of keep the podcast going, the lights on, uh, stuff like that, you can find us over on patreon.com slash best games period. And um, right now we are kind of working on doing, well, right now it's it's a little bit, of a downtime because uh, Daniel is moving and there's a bunch of other just things that are kind of up in the air at the moment, but we will be back week after week to kind of talk about games and talk about the best games. And on top of that, I am also developing a new podcast. The first episode of which is actually up on Patreon and you can listen to that and it's a D and D podcast. So it's myself uh, friend of the show, Marcus Stewart, and uh, two of my other friends, Alex and Kevin, playing through a game of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, there is a full campaign that I have planned out. I act as the DM, they act as my players, and it's just a good time. I encourage everyone to check it out and look forward to when it fully releases uh, sometime in the near future. Uh, we're waiting on stuff like logos and uh, thing things of that nature to be finished up. All, all the little, we want to cross the T's and dot the I's or cross the I's and dot the T's or all that good stuff. So, yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be great. And everything is going to be fun great. So... Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me babble about FTL and how great it is. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you all on the flippity-dippity. Flippity-dippity.